Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where I talk about TV shows of the supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about Evil Season 4, Episode 10. A great episode. A lot of really interesting things. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode. So let's break it down. I love obviously the, you know, the title of this episode is like How to Survive a Storm. And I love that we are picking up that thread where it seems like, oh, the world's kind of a little more chaotic and storms, and this episode revolves around it. And it's so interesting considering like the chaos that is a storm and the chaos that is the threads of this episode in so many capacities i mean you have kristen's kids worried and freaking out because everything's making them more afraid of the storm which it seems like they should be more afraid of the storm but i think it is meant to be like this fear mongering thing to make you more scared because i mean we see people in general panicking because they do feel like it is kind of the end of the world even though it kind of does feel like the end of the world the storm like they cut the, you have this constant alert throughout the episode of like oh the storm has been raised to this category landfall 24 hours oh it's it's five now landfall in 12 hours type of situation then you also have like when what i think the show does so masterfully and so beautifully is weaving in those little background things like what is the main thing that they're watching and scaring them about the storm and it's like oh yeah it's someone on vid tap it's, it's it's once again just bringing in those little background threads of things that you use just kind of be like right that's meant to propagate the evil anymore kind of it feels like the storm gets stronger the more people are afraid of it. So that's just kind of perpetuating and fear-mongering people into this whole situation more and more. And obviously our kids are worried and scared. I mean, with everything they've had to deal with recently. I even love that Lexi brought up a really good point. She was like, you know, when we exercise those demons from our house, like, what if they just, like, actually didn't leave? Because she's like, I have seen stuff in our yard, which we did see at the end of one episode. She did see, like a whole bunch of ghosts outside or at least some like some entities outside so she's like what if we never like kicked them out like what if we just kicked them out into the neighborhood and stuff like that and it's like probably it's true i mean it's kind of like the supernatural thing it's like oh you can like unless you kill a demon you send it back to hell it'll it'll work its way back up at some point in time i don't think there's ever any restrictions of like oh man you're you're in a timeout it's going to take you about 15 hours like that never came up at least not to my recollection i'd assume the same thing is applicable here i mean we had the whole thing about the house is always regenerating over time so it just it kind of feeds into that narrative of like we kind of put a band-aid on this situation rather than permanently it's 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 a it's a temporary remedy rather than a permanent cure. So I just, I just think that's kind of a, a fascinating thing. I was not expect like I was not expecting that storyline of like them like sneaking over to their neighbor's house to turn out it, Leland being the neighbor. I thought that was such a beautiful twist. It makes all the sense in the world, but it was still so beautifully done because. I mean, he, they they looked into it and they're like, yeah, like Leland bought that property like a week ago. So he's just been waiting like that was he I guess he was just waiting for the right circumstances that were necessary to like set that up because he tried to send Leslie to drop off Timothy. And the moment Leslie showed up and like, oh, you need to you need to take uh, Timothy. I was like, mm, right, Leslie, this ain't the first time. Well, Leslie's kind of chosen what side because Cheryl bounced and it's like, no, no, Leland, you're the boss, so I'm a, I'm a cow toe to you. So once again, she didn't really tell, she told Cheryl the whole like, oh, they're plotting to feed Kristen. Well, initially Leslie thought it was like her, they were going to try and feed to Timothy, but then like she was okay and never warned Kristen about anything. So it kind of showed you that Leslie is the flip floppy type, but then it's like, oh no, she's on Cheryl's side. But the moment, you know, the, um, this is the reference that comes to mind. If you've seen Shogun, you know what I'm about to say. It's like, she's very Yabushige. She's Yabushige coded, um, which is kind of hilarious. Uh, if you've seen Shogun, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but anyway, tangents and all that aside, it just kind of like she's so flip floppy of like, oh yeah, which way is the wind turning? Like, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, because I'm stuck at the company. It does make you wonder what happened to all the other women that kind of went behind Leland's back. Leslie's okay because she's like, well, she's the surrogate mother, so she has a little more leeway. We don't know what that means for the rest of the women in the company that back Cheryl's coup, you know, so. They might be worse off and they might have gotten fired and by fired they might have been like let go and by let go they might have been killed. Or they might have actually just legitimately let go. I don't know. Let's face it, no one in the company is good. Everyone knows what's going on in that company so everyone is culpable and an accomplice to all the evil that that company is responsible for. 
that's both in the you know there's the metaphorical like oh the evil that a company can do versus like no the literal evil in the show where it's like no this is a demonic company doing evil shit and spreading evil in the world it's just there's layers to that whole situation which i think is just so fascinating and i i, I love that two-way like moment where like david is seeing that Leland is Kristen's neighbor and Kristen finding it out at the same time. I was like, I thought that was so beautifully poetic how that was doing it uh, because, um, because David was remote viewing Leland because Dominic told him, do not view it. Like, he's like, right, he's not the evil coming to New York, but he's the organizer of it because they heard, I guess, through the grapevine, I mean, through their connections, they were able to find out like, oh, Leland is basically the one that took over DF that, you know, they knew there was a new leadership change, but they didn't know who was in charge. And it's like, well, yeah, cause, uh, Leland, it makes sense. Leland's been our main dude, um, our main evil dude throughout this entire show. So for him to worm his way, he's always been that squirrely, weaselly, ooh, Leland. Um, he's always been that guy. So for him to have that situation now and be where he is at the top of everything makes sense. He's all he's he's amongst the villains. He's the cockroach villain where he's just like, no matter what you do, he always comes back. He survives no matter what you do. And that's ever so true in this episode. But we'll get to that in a bit. It's interesting, too, because Cheryl tried to contact Kristen early on in the episode. I love that she's looking at someone. She's like almost like is that mom. And said, Cheryl comes over and is like, hey, you got to protect the girls here. Stun guns. And Kristen just thinking like, mom, you're a little off your rocker. Or like, let me contact Kurt. And, you know, maybe there's a mix on your medication. She's like, I'm not on any medications right now. I got to go. There's demons disguised as people. And it's like for Kristen, it's like, OK, mom, you're going to sound crazy. Granted, if that's I mean, she already kind of looks at Andrea a certain way, consider Andrea, uh, Sister Andrea, like, sees demons and stuff like that, and even David isn't able to see them, but, you know, even him being the church guy he is, like, I think sometimes he flip-flops on whether he trusts Andrea, so it's just, it's just, it's just kind of sad, because it's like, we know Sister Andrea is not crazy, and we know Cheryl is not crazy, but it's like, from Kristen's perspective, it's like, okay, mom, you've already been off your rocker for a while, and I'm assuming this is just further proof of that, so... But either way, I love that it's like, right, we're hunkering down so it's not just uh, not just Kristen and her girls, which she was ready for. It's like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to jot down everything possible. Like any infraction that Leland poses, we're, when the storm passes, we are going to get another restraining order and it's going to stick. We're going to record everything, any little interaction or harassment because it's like yeah they've already got a strike against him and if they have this it'll be a continued example of right this guy is stalking harassing my family but luckily david and ben come over and ben well david's got the plan of well i can remote view and if not i can i could kill leland and then there's also the situation with ben being like well i can I, like your sewage lines are connected i could fuck with him that way you know it's like but i, I pre once again it's like this team is ride or die it's like we know how much a piece of shit leland is you're scared for your family we will do what we can to like screw with him and mess with him and even david went to father ignatius and was like should in the eyes of the lord would it be okay like you know someone is going to do something terrible if you kill them, like, will God forgive you? And it's kind of like, well, murder is still murder regardless of the circumstances. But even Ignatius, I thought was beautiful, this um, um, line he had where he's basically talking about his, his shaky, like, even he's like, sometimes I wonder, do I actually believe? And he's like, if I had the opportunity, I would kill the person who killed uh, Matt, uh, you know, the Monsignor. And it's like, it's, it's literally the same boat as David, you know? And he's kind of like, yeah, I believe that that would be in service of God. Like, he likes, I would want to believe that. And so that gives David the motivation to remote view and, in fact, control um, Leland. Really quickly, just want to interject this. I did not think about this. I don't know why it just finally popped in my head, but the remote viewing angle to this reminds me of there's this uh, webtoon manhwa series called Connect. Uh, they did, like, there is a live-action adaptation on um, Hulu, but uh, I, I won't spoil it. If you've never seen it, I go into it blind, but it kind of has a remote viewing thing. I just don't want to tell you what the twist of it is, so I want you to go into it not knowing, but it kind of makes me think of it. It's not the same thing at all, but it just, it, it's in the same realm of, like, just, like, oh, the remote viewing and how, like, what the story Connect is about, but it's just that 
it, it, I guess because I was recently reading the webtoons, I guess that's why like I had it fresh in my head a little bit. But either way, tangents and all that aside. Either way, the moment David started doing the like remote viewing and then trying to take control of Leland, I'm, my immediate thought was Leland's fucking with you. I was like, he has to be. There's no way he's not messing with you, right? Like he's playing along or something. Because I expected him the moment David start remote viewing, I expected Leland to turn to be like, hello, David. Like, which he kind of does later. But I love that David's like, all right, I got control of you. It's like, all right, drink some bleach. Okay, there's no bleach. Okay, Cut yourself, stab yourself, or cut yourself with a knife. There's no knives. It's like, Leland was prepared for this. Like, he made sure there was nothing in here. Either he just had, like, he must, he knew this was coming at some point in time, but he has some pokers here, but before he can do anything, at first I was wondering if David was going to have, like, a come to Jesus moment, but it's like, no, he didn't. It was Leland taking control of him, like, hello, David. And I was like, yo, this motherfucker Uno reversed you. I was like, because I was, the moment it was happening, I was like, the only way this is going to stop Ben is going to like F with his sewage system and that's going to distract him because you need a lot of focus for this. And lo and behold, that's what happens. Like good timing on you, Ben, because I knew that's what the, because we knew Ben was working on that in the background. I knew that would coincide with this. Luckily, Sister Andrea got to David at the same time. I don't know if she just happened to be walking by by the grace of God or whether it was just uh, she sensed something was wrong in the force. Either way, we get some bombshells dropped about our good old friend Leland Apparently, he was training to be a priest for 10 years. In fact, he was actually going to become a member of the entity or Friends of the Vatican, yada, yada, yada. And the fact is, Dominic trained him. So it's like, oh, I told you not to like get into Leland's body. It's like, then why the fuck didn't you tell me early on? No wonder Leland knows these tactics so well. The motherfucker, you know, he was an insider. I mean, and I guess that's that's that makes him such a useful tool and weapon because it's like, yeah, if you're able to take someone who was going down that route, and bring them to evil. Now, who knows? Maybe Leland was on his bullshit even back then that this was like a long con of like, oh, let me get so close and personal with all of this so that I can find you from like, um, basically being an insider, uh, pulling a little bit of a go-go loser ranger if you've seen it. Kind of like if that was the intention, but I would assume with all the church and stuff, 10 years, there's no way you could do it. Hey, maybe, but I'd assume he got corrupted after the fact. But he's really good and really powerful, and now he has a doorway into David's mind. And it's like, yeah, but Dominic, you didn't do jack shit to warn anybody ahead of time. Because, I get it, you don't want to, like, you know, put that out there that literally the biggest villain of the show was actually, a, you know, going to become a priest, training to be a priest at one point in time, ready to join your one of your ranks. Because you also don't want to admit your fault because you trained him, you know? So it feels so befitting that this like new weapon against evil is someone you're training that's David versus the person you trained all these years ago. So it's like, it's fascinating. So now it's like, I would almost want them to have some confrontation at some point in time because it's like, now that now that they've set the stage for that, it's like, it has to happen, right? But we'll talk about some of the more lengthier conversations at the very end where I would talk about where things potentially could go and stuff like that. But either way. And it's like, well, the only way to stop Leland, and I even love Sister Andrew is the one that says, like, kill him. I'm like, so, I'm like, everyone's kind of on board with the kill Leland thing. I mean, Leland's needed to die for a long time, and it's just like, everyone's kind of on, on board with this situation, so. Tying that all in, I mean, I think it specifically was after that scene we cut to Cheryl at the DF office, and it's like, well, they're the few places that probably still has, like, power and stuff like that, so she's, like, putting out, like, an announcement, I think a tweet being like, oh my god, so sad that Leland Townsend's dead, and, you know, trying to tank the company, um... And then Kurt shows up, and I love um, her reservation because she's like, all right, show me the back of your neck. And he's like, what? She's like, turn around and sh lower your collar. And it's like, okay, trying to make sure he wasn't a demon in disguise. And then it's like, what's going on? Uh, your daughter's worried about you. Obviously, Kurt trying to play the role of a, a good doctor and therapist and trying to make sure that she's okay. But she's like, yeah, I'm trying to bring down this company and stuff like that. And then the guy shows up and like, oh, yeah, I want those uh, those reports and stuff like that. It even you got to admit, that is a little weird. The building is pr practically empty, and this random guy is kind of like, hey, Cheryl, I'm going to need those reports. 
And I was just like, that's kind of weird. And I love that Cheryl's like, he's a demon. And Kurt's like, no, come on. There's a reasonable explanation. And home dude proceeds to take off his skin suit. I could not help but laugh. I was like, this is fucking hilarious that Kurt, because Kurt's already had his run in with demons, but he's thought like, oh, I'm hallucinating and shit like that. And now it's like, nah, nah, son, this is a... this is this is happening and you have to get away from the demon and i once again this show it could i love how like like how scary and eerie this show can be but also how silly it can be when like home dude is coming after them but he's tripped like he's he has to like he has to waddle because his skin suit is literally his pants are around his ankles his literal skin suits around his ankles i'm like i love that and even when he was reaching up trying to grab them when they went up to like the the Good thing that ceiling's no longer there, huh? Um, but yeah, he he couldn't get up because you could still see that he still ain't got his skin suit off his feet. I was like, that's fucking hilarious. Because I do believe that's the same demon that was in that uh, Leland's house that Lexus ended up running into, which feels very poetic. Like the other three were hiding in a different closet. She was hiding in the bathroom. Uh, I was like, ah, uh, interesting. Because at first I was like, I don't think, it's not George. At least I don't believe that's George. I, at first, but it was like, it, they're the same ilk as George. But yeah, it's not George though. I even love our boy Kurt dropping the term fully ado. Which I feel like this is like the second time outside of Joker I've heard that term recently. I can't remember what it was. There was something else that used the term fully ado and I don't remember. I don't think it was this show, but I, it was... Maybe it was. I could have sworn Fully Ado came up in, like, like I said, outside of the Joker sequel. Because I remember, like, the Joker sequel, like, that title was, like, announced. And then, like, I, I saw it in, like, a TV show or something. I was like, oh, interesting. You know, the whole, like, shared delusion thing, you know? Because Kurt's even trying to rationalize it, being like, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And then even Cheryl's like, yeah, maybe we weren't hallucinating. And maybe that literally was. Because it's like, yeah, Kurt's kind of like, wow, that's, that's giving me something to write about, you know? And so I did like that moment and I was kind of like, huh, they've never had many moments together, have they, Kurt and Cheryl? You know, it feels very poetic, but then she decided to leave those letters, um, those envelopes rather. We find out they're not letters later on, but to Andy and Kristen. Um, Cause we have not checked on Andy for a while. Like we heard from Kristen, Andy, I think the last time they talked about that was when Kristen dropped him off essentially. But I, I, I think that's the last time we really touched on, like, his status and stuff like that. But I'd assume Kurt was going to try and get that to Andy. I could see that leading to Andy coming back home just because it's, like, I'm sh as we find out later on, like, you know, Cheryl's dying message. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. But it's, like, I'm assuming what she sent to Kristen is one thing, and she sent another thing to Andy. I don't think they have shared information. Like, she probably wants Andy to know specific stuff. It's like, hey, you're not going crazy. Yeah, we did this stuff to you, which is going to sound crazy. I, I don't know. We only saw a fraction, uh, a very small fraction of what Cheryl put in Kristen's, like, flash drive. So we have no idea what else could have been up there. And if it does overlap with what she sent to Andy. I'd assume because there were two separate envelopes, that Andy's is very specific to his circumstances. So he realizes, yeah, you're not crazy. Uh, me and Layla were fucking with you. And controlling you and stuff like that. So whether Andy would believe that or not, I don't know. But yeah, Cheryl left that because she knew there was a good chance she might not survive the situation. She was hopeful. She was still going to gun for that bastard. But she knew there was a chance it wasn't going to work out. And she came so close. She spiked his um, his concoction. Because at the same time this is all happening, um, David is trying to stop... Uh, Leland from being able to control him and he has uh, Ben and Kristen try to help with that and they got some dirt on Leland about you know he was a band geek he was um, what was it Jake the flake was his name like nickname or something like that and so they play like marching band music and it just like triggered him you know it's like I mean that's the thing of like when you like Leland is, you know, he's got kind of like a Napoleon complex to, to an extent. Not, not, it's not equatable, uh, really, but it's still the thing of 
he felt small and inferior and was just kind of the butt of the joke. And it's just like now he gets, like he, he is legitimately just someone that was bullied and now he gets to be the bully. And now that trauma is coming back up. And no matter how far away you've gotten, that's because it's, it's, it's integral to who he is. He became who he was. He made, he was, he became someone that was so easily corruptible potentially, you know, because of his past. And now it's being used against him. And it's like, yeah, no matter how many years go by, like when you were treated like shit, like that stays with you. Those scars are still there. And you're kind of like, I kind of sucks. Like they create the monster that you are. They at least help make you the monster that you are potentially, you know? But yeah, like, uh, he could get the music out of his head, and so he ends up going and injecting himself, and it, Cheryl almost got him, which I felt think is poetic, considering he poisoned the manager last episode, and now he got poisoned, and Cheryl's ready to slit his throat, but then, like, the demon showed up, it's like, yo, I can't, I, I saved your ass again, I can't keep covering for you, homie, you gotta handle this. So, what does he do? He tosses Cheryl out a four-story uh, window, um... And made it seem like, oh, she just fell out of the window because of the storm. It makes sense, because I'm like, if you try to do anything else, foul play would be, like, it'd be investigated. So, why not just make it seem like it was an accident, yada, yada, yada. Which is like, ah, oh, damn, that sucks. It's like, once again, as I brought up before, the cockroach that is Leland Townsend, like, the bastard just never dies. He just keeps coming back. But either way, going back to it, because the music was distracting Leland... He was no longer able, like, I don't know if this completely closes the door on his control over David, whether that door is permanently shut now. I doubt it, but, I mean, it seems like he's going for now, but that doorway will always be openable to some extent going forward, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if that, like I said, I don't know if that means it's permanently shut. Either way, the storm had gotten worse at that time, and... Like, stuff was smashing through them. And I love Laura's jet jumping on the couch. And it's like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, like, you know. Then we find out. I think it was, like, the new room Lila's supposed to go in. She's like, yo, like, some crap. Like, the ceiling crashed in. Like, if I was in there, they were like, yeah, Lila would be dead. So, like, they rush to the bathroom. Lynn happens to see, um sister andrea outside and she's getting attacked both by like the storm demon i don't remember what it's called like i don't know if it was like the gray man or the shadow man the lady on um vid tap had referenced him of like oh you see him you should run yada 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 and there he is confronting sister andrea while she's getting cut up by that other demon i was like is she gonna die here are they gonna make like some a storm or something like something from the storm hit her and make her die that way but the demon approach the thing approaches her and it's like right God doesn't control this weather. I do. You are just an old woman. Because she's like, you don't scare us. And it's like, you are nothing in the long run. And uh, yeah, she uh, passes out. Luckily, they brought her in and she's okay. But then she's like, cool, let's pray. And I, I think it's so poetic that everyone, the, the people who don't pray. I think he, I think David's like silently praying. But like, I don't think he gets down with the others. But like, Lynn, um, Lynn obviously, Lila and Laura pray. But who's the one that does it? Lexus. But also Ben and um, Ben and Kristen don't either. But I felt like it's so poetic that the one, of the, the one daughter that doesn't end up praying is Lexus. But maybe she was praying inside of her head. I doubt it. But still, I think that's fascinating. But luckily, the storm passes. And they're all kind of together. And I love like that conversation between David and Kristen. It's like, he's like, I wish I had two lives. One for God and one for you. And she's like, I wish I had two lives and both of them for you. And then Ben had to ruin a moment. What about me? And Kristen's like, three lives then. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. Um, once again, I also, I keep, I always bring it up. It's one of my favorite relationships in the show too is uh, Ben's like dynamic with the kids. They're like, oh, Ben, Ben, why, why are you wearing the hay? She's like, whoa, this is a Ben only hat. And they're like, oh, come on. You're not going to share it? I just, I love like how like, and I, I just love that it's been this constant through line throughout the entire series, like how they've always been fascinated by Ben. Because I, like, I think in their eyes, they're like, oh my God, Ben's kind of our cool uncle in a in a, in a in an interesting way. Um, but yeah, like the, the sad situation about um, Cheryl, I was like, fuck, dude. I was like, is this really how this is going to go? And it's like, yeah, 
Uh, they had her at the hospital, and it doesn't seem like, sadly, she's going to make it. I mean, once again, she fell for four stories. Being alive at all was a miracle. But yeah, she wasn't going to make it. And it's the heartbreaking thing of, like, her grandkids having to say goodbye. She's not able to speak a lot. She's able to speak a little bit, but... And I was like, is she going to tell Kristen that Leland was responsible for this? And it's like, well, she left what she left, but she wasn't even talking about that. Because what mattered at the very end was like, Kristen, can you, I'm sorry for everything. Can you forgive me? Kristen never says the words, but I think it's kind of acknowledged. Like, I do. And it's like, I love you, mom. And it's like, do you, David's here. Do you want the last rites? You don't have to, but they're here. And she, she accepts them. You know, and I think it's just kind of like, hey, God is forgiving you because she's like, am I going to go to hell after? I mean, I'm going to hell for all the stuff I've done, but, you know, maybe there's something to this. And, you know, maybe there will be no, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. And then, you know, sadly, she dies. And, you know, it's like it you can tell how much it hurts Kristen in so many different ways. One, she actually talks about with uh, about the kids because she felt bad because like up, up until now she had kept uh Cheryl away from her grandkids and it's like I kind of robbed them of more time with their grandmother because their grandmother was like their best friend they loved her so much and it's like I mean granted secretly she had time with them that you're just not aware of but still it's it's not like they haven't interacted with her or seen her at all it's like they've seen her recently so but it's still like yeah they could have had more time with her I think it's a good thing you didn't have Cheryl around during that time you even with, once again, all the flash drive stuff, I don't know how much Cheryl admitted her part in all of this. But it's like, yeah, she was up to some fuck shit. She was like, and that's what she wanted forgiveness for. It's like, I've done a lot of terrible things, but I wanted to try and make things right. Because at the end of the day, my daughter and my grandkids are like the most important people to me in this world. So I wanted to try and make things right by taking Leland out. But sadly, wasn't able to. But she kind of still had a beyond the grave middle finger, uh, you know, contingency set up and Leland gets arrested because of what they were able to find. I don't think there are any other bodies back there, but it could have been like Cheryl probably like filmed it when there were bodies back there. Once again, we don't know the full extent of everything that was on that flash drive, but it was enough for the cops to show up, have a warrant, search the room and bust Leland. But it wasn't just Leland that got busted. Leslie was there kind of as an accomplice too. So it's like, well, I probably should have chose a better side. So it's like, oh, okay, that's been taken care of. Well, that's not all there is to it, too, because now we have our little stinger at the end where it's like, well, because Leland got arrested and Leslie's out of the picture because she's under questioning now, now they kind of have to decide, well, either the child goes into a foster care situation or you as a biological mother have to choose to take your child in. So it's like, huh, it's like Jesus Christ. And it's like, yeah, like, holy, and that's the thing. Leland kind of got what he wanted in the end. Probably didn't expect this to be the way it went down, but it's still, you know, you still win in the end because now Timothy's back with Kristen. And like the whole point is Kristen's going to be the one that corrupts him. You know, it's like even though he's been baptized, it's like, once again, Leland had this whole thing last episode about like natured evil versus, uh, no, na yeah, natured evil versus nurtured evil. So. And that's just kind of where we leave it up. It's like, yeah, Kristen, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I was like, oh, yeah. Of course, she has to think about this now after her um, after her mom died, after Leslie tried to, like, put Timothy off on her. And it's like, no, no, didn't want anything to do with this situation. And now you kind of have no choice. It's all hitting you all at once. So I'm excited to see where the next episodes ultimately end up taking us with these last four episodes of the series. Like I said, I'm getting to this extremely late. Uh, it is Wednesday at the time you're recording this. Uh, so, the uh, episodes 11, 12, and 13 are already out, and the final episode is going to drop tomorrow, so. But either way, uh, to the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live light to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day, and goodbye.